yes, I believe the Saudis are warming towards making full peace and normalization with Israel. I think all the signals are, are there. Are the Saudis getting ready to make peace with Israel? Hi, and welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. Today, we're talking to Joel Rosenberg to answer that very burning question. Joel, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Well, it's great to be with you, Carl. And uh, I feel kind of funny that normally I'm in the epicenter when we're talking about these things. But, you know, God bless President Biden. You know, of all the 52 weeks of the year that he could choose to go to the Middle East, he chose a a period of time when I was going to be in the United States. Right. I mean, I'm, he didn't consult me with it, obviously. <laughs> uh, but to go to Israel, he was literally in my hometown of Jerusalem. And then, of course, to Saudi Arabia. It was a big decision for him to go. Sure. There was a lot of criticism about him going to Saudi Arabia. Um, I, this is non, we're a nonpartisan organization as the Joshua Fund. And, and so I'm not making any partisan points, but I will just say as a positive, I think it's positive when the president of the United States travels to Israel. Oh, yeah. Uh, especially, uh, you know, I think it should be bipartisan support for Israel. And to go to Saudi Arabia, uh, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Why is that controversial? It, it is controversial, and particularly inside the Democratic Party. Yeah. But it's important because of this question. Are the Saudis sort of warming to the idea of making peace with Israel? And so how could you and I ignore uh, the leader of the free world going to the very countries that we talk about right. all the time and, and analyzing it uh, from a biblical perspective? What's the biblical significance of what's happening right now, but what's also the geopolitical significance. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this episode. Right, me too. I, I, I meant to give you a fist bump on the uh, on the way here, uh, based on based on what we saw from uh, President Biden's uh, visits to the region. But but Joel, this question of whether the Saudis are warming to make peace with Jerusalem would would have some tremendous implications on Israel, on the United States and the entire region. What are some of the most significant implications of President Biden's visit to Israel and Saudi Arabia, do you think? Well, the first thing that was significant about the president's visit was uh, that he gave the good housekeeping seal of approval, as it were, as a, as a Democrat to uh, bipartisan support for Israel. That has been under some attack by some members in I would say the more far left progressive areas of the Democratic Party. You think of some of the members, uh, Congresswomen like uh, AOC and Rashida Tlaib and, and Ilan Omar and, and, and Bernie Sanders in the Senate, who's Jewish, but has been very hostile to Israel. Uh, Joe Biden um, considers himself a Zionist. He says that publicly. He says you don't have to be Jewish to believe that Israel has, you know, not only a right, but a, but a bit of a, even a biblical calling. He he he. He cited scripture a few times in his time in Israel, but he also, but, but I would say, you know, again, I'm trying not to be partisan, I, I, but I'm just saying, I think uh, Joe Biden is among the, is maybe the best in the Democratic Party in terms of standing with Israel and saying, listen, we have disagreements and we, our policies may be different than Trump on some things, but, but standing with Israel should not be a partisan divide. It's one of the few things, actually, Carl, as you know, that the two parties are not primarily divided mm -hmm. on in Washington or in the country. Yes, there, I would say there's more in the Democratic Party of resistance to that. And I mentioned some of the names that are most prominent in that. But overall, um, you know, there's bipartisan funding and of, of defense systems and all this for Israel. So for an American president who has 192 countries that are in his, you know, option list to go visit, when you when you go to a visit a country of less than ten million, Israel, that's a big deal. Yeah. And when you go to Saudi Arabia as the president who who um, has been so critical of Saudi Arabia and particularly Saudi's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, known by many by his initials MBS, Joe Biden, both as a candidate and as the president of the United States, has been very sharply critical uh, of the Saudis in general and MBS in particular. So for him to make the decision 
that he's going and and believes that the Saudi US strategic alliance is important, even though there are some fundamental disagreements that Biden has with them. That was a big deal. Yeah. And one more thing, uh, you know, President Biden didn't only meet with Saudi leadership. He did, but he also uh, met with the leaders of what's called the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. These are the other Arab countries in the region, um, uh, including uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, Qatar. Uh, and, and so these countries are significant. Uh, they're, they're mostly small, but they're oil rich, they're gas, natural gas rich, and they play a, an important role together in the security of the Arab world, especially as the Iran threat rises. Right. And so, again, when you look at the, the from not just from an American alliance status, but from strengthening those alliances at a time when Iran risks a, a nuclear war with everybody, you know, getting close and closer to that moment, God forbid, mm. but that's the fear, right? And so it was the right thing to do for any American president and particularly a Democrat who's had such problems and have been so out, so vocal about those differences, sharp differences with the Saudis in particular, to go and say, yeah, yeah we've got sharp dis disagreements, but we're going to talk about them heart to heart, face to face. Yeah. And uh, I think that it, it was significant. And I and I you know and I in my columns on all Israel and all Arab news, I uh, I praise the president for that, even though I didn't agree with every you know, move that he made. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think it's obvious too, you know, for many of us here in the United States, it, it, the, the pushback from uh, the left on this trip was, was really intense. It was uh, first of all, many on the left, although there is still bipartisan support for Israel, no question, but many on the left have wrongly accused Israel of, of, of being uh, a bad actor in the region uh, to the to the degree that you know we should we should question our alliance with them that's the extreme left uh, in some in some quarters but they also like you said look at Saudi Arabia and many people on the right join them as a as a a terrorist state still you know thinking about the way the world was in in uh 2001 and many of the things uh that that are there got a lot of pushback for Biden, uh, President Biden going on this trip. So maybe you can help explain where those pushbacks were wrong or perhaps, you know, some of the things that, that you could give some insight into, into how this trip might have achieved some things uh, to, to overcome some of those perceptions. Oh, I'd be happy to. And I, in a, in a moment, we'll get into an exclusive poll that we did for all Arab news and all Israel news, um, in which we looked at, we asked uh, through a, a major um, polling company in the United States, we asked American people, do you want to see Saudi Arabia make peace with Israel? And do you want President Biden to make it a top foreign policy priority to, to broker that deal? We'll get to that, uh, those questions in a moment. I think those are very interesting. But yeah, look, there, there, there are several reasons that uh, President Biden and many in the Democratic Party, and as you rightly note, many in the Republican Party, have been very sharply critical of Saudi Arabia for in recent years. Um, now, let's be clear what they're not critical of. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, almost 21 years ago now, on September 11th, 2001, 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Saudis. 15 of the 19. But that wasn't the Saudi government. That these were Saudi uh, nationals, but they were based out of Afghanistan. They were working for a Saudi national himself, mm -hmm. though Osama bin Laden. And so people connected Saudi Arabia with terrorism. Yeah. And even though I would say, and I and I and I talk about in enemies and allies in that book, that the Saudi government isn't like they didn't design that attack. They've been a they've been an ally of the United States. They sell Israel, uh, they sell the United States oil and, and they've been a key ally, um, f a flawed ally, but, a, but an important one in the region as a bulwark against Saddam Hussein in his day against the Ayatollah 
Khomeini in his day against the Ayatollah Khamenei in this day. You know, the Saudis have actually stood with us and against ISIS, the Islamic Mm -hmm. State, and the genocide against Christians and others that were going on there in the region. So the Saudis have played an important role and they and they played an important role after 9-11. But in Americans' minds, when you hear that 15 of 19 people involved in this horrific attack against the United States are Saudi nationals, and that the whole operation was designed by a Saudi, Osama bin Laden, you think these are bad people. And and and, and even though the government didn't do it, uh, and there's no evidence, there's no conclusive evidence that they did or they encouraged it or in any way, nothing. So that's important. But, but even the Saudis themselves acknowledged that there was a climate yeah. of extremism inside the Saudi mosques, inside the Saudi education system. And, and so hatred for the United States, for Jews, for Christians was embedded hmm. in a lot of the teachings of the clerics in the mosque, not, Hey, let's go kill them. But we hate them. They're, they're horrible. They, you know, let's drive them out of the region. The Israelis are horrible. A lot of that teaching was in the mosque and in the and in the textbooks in the schools. What has happened is very interesting and complicated. But the short version is, you know, about four five years ago, an entirely new king emerged, King Salman, and his son emerged as his crown prince, the number two in. In, in, their, in the succession of power, Mohammed bin Salman, the Mohammed, the son of Salman. And, and these two, the king and the crown prince, have embarked in sweeping change inside Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. including changing the, all those textbooks and firing 3,500 extremist uh, clerics who preach in Saudi mosques who wouldn't, who refuse to change. Yeah who refused to get rid of all the extremism and and move towards a moderate, tolerant, you know, peaceful uh, messaging. Uh, so, the, so the king and his son have actually taken bold steps. Also, obviously, as, he, as many people know, uh, allowing women to drive for the first time in the kingdom and allowing women to go to soccer matches and, you know, own restaurants and travel without having their father or brother, you know, sign off on their even ability to get a passport. There's been a lot of social change that's been very positive and for which the Saudi government deserves a lot of credit, actually. Why they waited this long, that was the problem. But okay, they're changing. Hmm. But also what they're changing is they're firing the extremists and they're changing the textbooks and it's taken some time. But those are real changes. Yeah. And even some of the strongest skeptics in the United States and elsewhere around the world are, are, are admitting this is positive change. Mm-hmm. There's much more that has to be done, but it is changing. But, but just at this moment of sweeping change that is so positive and overdue came the, the murder of a Saudi dissident, mm. right? The Saudi journalist, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, mm-hmm. who had essentially been exiled out of Saudi Arabia because he, he turned to be against such a critic of the new king and his son and became a, a, a Washington Post columnist. And that yeah. man uh, tr- was tragically, Jamal Khashoggi was tragically sort of lured into a Saudi consulate mm-hmm. in Turkey in 2018 and murdered mm. um, yeah. and even butchered. This was heinous. This was disgusting. This was horrifying. It was there's no way to justify it. you. Mm-hmm. It was just horrible. The, and that happened right in the middle of the reform movement. And then right. people had to decide. People like President Trump in his time, President Biden now, among as well as members of Congress, as well as business leaders and faith leaders, and everybody had it. Like, did MBS, the Crown Prince, did he order? This man to be murdered? Did he order him to be chopped up in pieces? Mm. Or did he at least know about it and not say anything or actually encourage it? Or did he not know and it was done by a rogue element? Now, they actually arrested about 25 people. They prosecuted about 18. And most of those are in prison. They they were convicted and they're in prison. Uh, They were... I think some of them were given a death sentence, but that was commuted. Um, but the point is, this has complicated enormously yeah. uh, 
people's perception of Saudi Arabia and is this crown prince, you know, the, the king is quite old. I think he's 86 or so. He's in poor health. So he's not making day-to-day -day decisions. He's mm -hmm. essentially deputized his son to run the country. Mm -hmm. So if this, M this man MBS is a good man who's basically trying to take the country in the wrong way and was not involved in this murder and this murder through dust in everyone's eyes and changed the discussion, but he dealt with it and got them arrested and convicted and imprisoned, then you'd say, well, then that's basically going in the right direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if he is changing the country in, the, in a good direction, but murdering somebody so horrifically, then, then you would have Biden's reaction, which is, I don't know if I can deal with this guy. Yeah. That's the setup. That's the context yeah. to this recent trip. And then add just one last piece. The Israelis are thinking, okay, I'm not sure we as a little country mm -hmm. of less than 10 million people in a very volatile region have the luxury of assessing whether this crown prince is a murderer or not. Right. If that man is willing to make peace with us, but you say, well, if he's a murderer, how can you trust him? Like, right. Those are all serious Legit questions. questions yeah. And, and the Israelis are like, Israelis want a peace treaty. And we see signals that MBS seems to want peace with Israel. Yeah. But that's the, you know, we can get into that more in a moment, but it, that's, yeah. that's the, that's the construct in which everyone has a view one way or another. And it's a, uh, it's a complicated conversation. It's very complicated, as are all conversations, it seems like, when we're talking about the epicenter. But uh, I, I, I think... Right. We, yeah, and we don't seem to be dealing with many easy ones. Right. right. Uh, quickly, before we have to take a break, Joel, you know, we've talked about the, the, the idea that both Israel and a number of these Gulf countries, UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, face a common foe in Iran. Um, maybe... Just do you think this trip was able to kind of contribute to a mutual uh, response to the to the threat of Iran between Israel, Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf states? Well, the fact that President Biden went to Israel and then to Saudi Arabia and met with MBS, uh, even though he didn't seem to want to, and met with all these other leaders from the region on the Arab side, um, again, very positive. It's very important. But he also had to do it. And the reason President Biden had to do it is because there's a growing distrust of President Biden's uh, either willingness or capacity or firmness in dealing with Iran. Hmm. OK, and part of that stems from how President Biden has handled Afghanistan, in which, you know, to make an analogy, you know, if you, those who are listening or watching remember the children, children's game Jenga. We have all these sticks that are interlocking and you each take a stick out and then you don't want to take out the last stick that makes the whole thing collapse. Well, in many ways, people feel like President Biden was warned, don't, don't take a series of steps in Afghanistan last year because you're going to end up pulling the Jenga stick out and the whole thing will collapse. And the Taliban, the terrorist organization that we've been fighting for 20 years, they'll get back in power. And President Biden said, no, 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 it's never going to happen. I know what I'm doing, but then he pulled the Jenga stick and the whole thing collapsed and yeah. the Taliban took over. And apparently was even the Taliban was even harboring uh, the number two in Al Qaeda over, you know, back in 20 or 9-11. And now, he, you know, the, mo the number one terrorist in Al Qaeda was Ayman al-Zawahiri. And he was living under Taliban protection in Afghanistan. And thank God President Biden ordered him to be taken out recently. So the world's a little bit safer for that. But Man. but but the region, Israelis and Arabs, are watching how Biden has handled this. They're also watching how President Biden has handled the situation with Putin and, and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, again, the, the challenge here is I'm not trying to draw partisan analogies, right? There were mistakes that President Trump made uh, in his presidency, and there are some mistakes that President Biden is making in his but what I'm saying is, in response to your question, the, the region of the Middle East is worried. Yeah. Worried that the United States is pulling out. Worried that the United States is losing interest in the region. Worried that President Biden doesn't have the, the interest in or the courage or the wherewithal. They all have different reasons and ways of saying it. But they're worried that he's not going to be there for them 
when Iran gets the bomb and and they fear that President Biden's feverish attempt to get the Iranians back into a nuclear deal that they didn't agree that the Arabs and the Israelis didn't agree with in the first place right. was creating anxiety. So President Biden had to go to the region and try to hold their hand and sort of try to encourage them and convince people, listen, I know what I'm doing and um, I am with you. The United States yeah. is with you. I'm not sure that he convinced them. Yeah. My conversations are not that positive, yeah. although they appreciated him coming and they want to give him the benefit of the doubt if they can. But this, there is a growing fear that Russia, Iran, China, North Korea, these are the powers that are emerging and threatening the, the peace and security and prosperity yeah. of the Middle East. And the United States is sort of getting distracted by internal issues and, and drifting away. And yeah. that's the setup. That's why he went. And I don't think he solved the problems. Uh, the question is whether the Saudis might make peace with Israel anyway, yeah. with or without Biden's help. Maybe we'll deal with that in a few minutes. Yeah, exactly. We're going to take a quick break, and I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about this Jerusalem declaration that was uh, that was stated uh, jointly by the U.S. and Israel while uh, President Biden was there. Um, we're going to take a quick break right now, though. Our verse of the day is found in Ezekiel 37, 26 and 27. And the Lord says, I will make a covenant of peace with them, it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Our prayer requests today are to pray for the people of Saudi Arabia, that they would be more open to the gospel and turn to Jesus from Islam. And second, Pray that any peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia would enable greater security and an openness to the gospel for many in both countries. Hey, Joel, we're back. Um, and I wanted to get back to something we talked about and uh, just touched on the, the Jerusalem Declaration that was jointly issued by Israel and, and the United States is supposed to take a tough stance on Iran's nuclear program and reaffirm Israel's right to defend itself. How do you think this will play in the region and affect the power dynamics there? I don't think it's going to really have much impact at all. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that declaration, but the problem is the very fact that it, as a piece of paper needed to be signed is a little bit of a signal that people are worried that it's, that the U.S. isn't going to do it, right? Right. The U.S. isn't beefing up its military assets in the Middle East right now. The, the United States under the Biden administration isn't putting a real credible military threat against Iran's nuclear facilities on the table. It's not pre-positioning forces saying, listen, look, we want to make a, a negotiated deal with you, but if you guys are willing to do this peacefully, we may have to take force. Biden doesn't want to do it. I, it's almost it's not impossible. But it's almost impossible to imagine a scenario in which President Biden is going to launch military attacks against Iran's nuclear facilities. Why? Because he's trying to get out of every war in the region and, and be the guy that made peace. The problem is we've seen past examples where, um, you know, you try to pull U.S. forces out and rather than making peace, which is what you want, it actually makes things worse. President Biden uh, when he was vice president of the United States back in 2011, uh, persuaded then President Barack Obama to pull all U.S. forces out of Iraq. I, I'm the idea that, look, uh, we're done with Iraq, <laughs> like enough already. Like, we don't want to be there. So let's just leave. But many people, even in, in, the, in the Obama administration at the time, including Defense Secretary Robert Gates, said that's a bad idea. You have to leave some residual force to keep to, to encourage and strengthen the local army so that they don't feel abandoned because they're fairly new at this. And you need, to, you know, and we have some assets and some capabilities that the local Iraqi army doesn't have. Anyway, Biden persuaded Obama to pull all U.S. forces out in the in the December of 2011. And what happened? The system collapsed for a while and ISIS surged into that and created a genocide and a caliphate larger than the size of Maryland and, hmm. or, or Massachusetts. That was bad. 
Christians were being slaughtered, beheaded mm. and, 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 and shot down and even crucified. So, you know, sometimes when you take an action like like, again, President Biden in Afghanistan, he what was his intent? Good. Hey, let's let's be done with Afghanistan. We've been there for 20 years. American people don't want to fight these wars forever. Let's leave. Yeah, that's good intent. But where are we now? We've yeah. seen the collapse of Afghanistan and it's rattling everybody. And women are back in burqas and and uh, Al Qaeda is, you know, resurgent. So that's the problem. And um, and I just say that we have to be praying as Christians. Look, you know, I, I, maybe President Trump would have made other bad decisions or, you know, I, I'm not trying to get into a Biden versus Trump. Right? This, that's not right. the purpose of inside the epicenter. It's not the purpose right. of the Joshua. I'm just saying I'm just looking at the reality of where we are. And I'm just telling you from talking to the leaders in the Middle East, as I've gotten to get to know them, they are not happy. Mm. Uh, they are worried that Iran is this close to the bomb. And so a, a, a a, a piece of paper that President Biden, Biden signs with a, uh, the, our new prime minister of Israel, uh, Yair Lapid, th- th- there's nothing wrong with the piece of paper. It's just that it, it's not, nobody's convinced that the United States under President Biden is going to stop Iran from getting the bomb. And again, yeah. in full disclosure, President Trump talked a tough game it, it's clear that his policies didn't stop Iran from getting closer and closer and closer to the bomb. And that's where we're heading, right? There, yeah. There's a real possibility that Iran is either going to get nuclear weapons yeah. or the United, or that Israel is going to have to go to war to stop this. And, and a whole new war could erupt in the Middle East. This is something we have to pray yeah. does not happen. Amen. Amen. You know, we talked about uh, uh, elements of this on previous podcasts. We've talked about uh, Russia and the relationship uh, it, it increasingly seems to have with with right. Iran and with Turkey. And we, we've talked about um, the the n- Iranian nuclear uh, threat really galvanizing responses in the region. I was particularly struck by pictures of, of uh, President Biden meeting in Israel and then meeting with the Saudis followed a week later, just a few days later by pictures of Putin and uh, the Supreme Mullahs in Iran and um, uh, uh, President uh, Erdogan in Turkey. There's, there's some serious visual implications right. for those things. And maybe we could talk a little bit about where you see this in that light. Well, yeah, I, I think you 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 captured it well, uh, and we should put those photos, uh, you know, in, in, the, show in the show notes, notes if we yeah. can. Uh, which is, you know, President uh, President uh, Putin out of Russia literally took his first trip out of Russia since he invaded Ukraine, which is itself a horrific war, um, and headed into Iran. And said, "Hey, why doesn't the Turkish leader come?" And I, like you and I talk about War of Gog and Magog, and are we close? And you know, it's hard to say. But let's—I mean, you see, three of the leaders of the countries that are in the prophecy meeting together at a time when no one else is meeting like that. Yeah. Immediately after the American president in Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, you say this is on purpose. Yeah, it's on purpose. There's two sides. There's two fronts yeah. forming. You know, and, and like a weather pattern. There's two fronts, and these two fronts are going to clash at some point mm-hmm. and that's where things are going to go bad. Yeah. But this brings up this key point. The Arabs are increasingly realizing that with the United States withdrawing or at least showing less interest in being engaged in actively engaged in the Middle East, that they better form an alliance together with each other and with Israel. This mm-hmm. is a big element, not the only, but it's a major element of why the United Arab Emirates decided to, to create the Arab Abraham Accords with Israel and normalize. This is why Bahrain decided on 9-11, by the way, September 11th, 2020, to send the signal, we want peace with Israel, yeah. and we're going to do it. We're going to actually make that announcement on the very anniversary of the worst attack on the United States uh, and the Western Alliance in, in modern history. And then, of course, Morocco. And I was just in Morocco. That's another topic we, we should discuss soon. Uh, fascinating. But but this is also why the Saudis are warming. I So, so to answer the, your question, yes, I believe the Saudis are warming 
towards making full peace and normalization with Israel. I think all the signals are are there. You don't. There are conversations I have personally had with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his inner circle that I'm not at liberty to discuss. Mm-hmm. I'm basing this, what I'm saying right now, not based on any conversation. I'm basing it on what do we actually see? We see the Saudis allowing um, the president of the United States, President Biden, to fly from directly from Israel to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, that flights never happened before. Air Force not, One has never done that trip. Right. Previously, the President Trump went from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to Israel, a direct flight that had never happened on Air Force One before. Plus, the Saudis are allowing Israeli and Emirati and Bahraini commercial airliners to fly back and forth over Saudi territory to each other's countries. Right. The Emiratis flying to Israel, Israel flying to the Emirati, uh, the Emirates, and the Bahrainis back and forth, so forth. This has never happened. And Amazing. there are many other steps, other signs. The fact that I, as an Israeli citizen and an American and a Jew and an evangelical, was invited twice to lead delegations to meet the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. That's never happened. That's crazy, uh, yes. To this day, I'm the only Israeli passport holder citizen who's ever publicly met, publicly openly met with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and yeah. done it twice. Yeah. This is not normal, but all these signs together suggest, yes, this is where the Saudis are going. Now, that being said, um, I don't believe the Saudis are ready to make it final quite yet. I think part of their problems with President Biden calling them a pariah state and and denigrating them and accusing MBS of murder when there isn't actually any mm-hmm. evidence that anyone has ever released, including the United States government, to prove that MBS murder, ordered the murder of Jamal Khashoggi or that even MBS knew about the murder ahead of time. There is no evidence, zero. I write about that in Enemies and Allies. I've interviewed people. I've, I, I look at the, the actual records. And I'm telling you, there is no evidence. Now, if it, if it exists, it hasn't been released. But President Biden has publicly accused him, MBS, yeah. of yeah. being the murderer. And apparently, at least Biden says he had he accused him of it to his face in Saudi Arabia. And yet, there are the New York Times reported that never happened, that Biden didn't get so strong and direct in that meeting. So I don't know who to believe, Carl. Yeah. But I'm just we're, saying. We're going to talk about that in that another podcast. <laughs> Yeah. The yeah. reason I'm saying it is because I really believed that that the Saudis might be ready enough, especially with the Iran threat that you've pointed out, to mm-hmm. make peace with Israel and let Biden have a win as being the guy that brokered it. But after that trip, um, I'm not ruling it out, but I, I suspect sure. that the Saudis don't want to give Joe Biden a win in foreign policy, that they sure. actually feel so uh, offended, deeply offended, that they want a good relationship with the United States, and they certainly want as good a relationship with President Biden and his team as they possibly can. But whether they're going to let Biden walk away with a Nobel Peace Prize for mm-hmm. having created the mother of all peace, I'm a little less sure of that than yeah. I was. But I think we should now mention the polling it shows the American people do want this to happen. Yeah, we're we're going to get that um, in in our next uh, podcast along these lines uh, because um, I I recognize that we won't have time on this one to actually deal with all of the implications of that. But quickly, Joel, before we have to leave, um, you know, uh, you you mentioned how uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Lapid, um, uh, you know, had had met with. Uh, President Biden of the U.S. and had said, uh, quote here, he said, he says, Mr. President, you will meet with the leaders of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, and Iraq. I would like you to pass them all a message from us. Our hand is outstretched for peace. Um, he is, he's called on President Biden to, to bring that message, but he's also called on President Biden to, to speak about using military action against Iran if they continue their nuclear program. Biden has not chosen to do that. Um, what do you think the implication of these kinds of, 
uh, conversations going on in the region would have for uh, the progress of peace within uh, Israel and, and these other countries? Well, I think Prime Minister uh, Yair Lapid is trying to be respectful and engage President Biden and Biden's inner circle as respectfully as he possibly can. But mm. I feel, feel fairly confident in telling you and our listeners and viewers that Prime Minister Lapid and most Israeli leaders are very worried. They're running, we're running out of time. Iran, Iran is so close to building nuclear weapons and not just one, but a whole arsenal. And there's no evidence that the Biden administration is preparing to stop them. Yeah. Almost nobody in Israel, in government, believes that if Iran signs this nuclear off deal offer in Vienna, that that's going to stop them from getting the bomb. Yeah. In yeah. fact, the, the, the preponderance of people say, you know, the growing uh, consensus is if they sign the deal, that'll be proof that this deal is horrible. That's yeah. what it so that's exactly. the, so and if, yeah. if if negotiations won't stop Iran, then what other option is there than mm. to bomb the facilities? Now, I'm not yeah. looking for that. I, I live in Israel. We, you know, Iran has its ally Hezbollah, the terrorist organization in Lebanon, with 150,000 ballistic missiles aimed at Israel. Yeah. Even though Israel has missile defense systems, layered missile defense systems, short, medium range, long, they are. we cannot shoot down every missile that's being fired from Lebanon. And if so, if, if the United States or Israel bombs yeah. uh, the nuclear sites in Iran, Iran could just ask Hezbollah to fire 150,000 missiles at us. Yep. That is a nightmare scenario. I actually wrote a novel about it, but this, is, this would be a real scenario. And I don't want to live yeah. through it yeah or die through it um so that's the challenge but the united states is much more capable yeah of taking out iran's nuclear facilities and 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 imposing real damage mm -hmm. on the iranian regime for violating well know, international agreement after international agreement after yeah. international agreement mar much more than israel israel i think can do it if it has to especially with arab assistance Mm -hmm. you know, refueling and bases and, but, but, but the United States, it, I'm not saying it's easy. It's never easy. And you don't want to, you know, you, you have kids that yeah. serve are serving yeah. in the military. I've had sons that have served in the military. We don't take this lightly. No. Okay. I don't want anyone to think, oh, well, you know, Joel's advocating. No, I'm not, I'm, but I'm saying Iran is getting close to having the capacity yeah. to bring about a second Holocaust. Yeah. This is what the Iranian regime wants. It yeah. wants the nuclear weapons capacity and the ballistic missile capacity to eliminate Israel, to mm -hmm. wipe Israel off the map. That's what it has mm -hmm. said repeatedly. Yeah. And that's killing six and a half million Jews. Yeah. That is a Holocaust scenario. And I, yes, if I had to, if there was no other choice, I would much rather take our chances going to war with Iran to preempt their Holocaust strategy yeah. than to let them try it. Yeah. Um, but that is a very dangerous scenario. So all that to say, um, I think there's a lack of confidence in the Middle East, yeah. including when Prime Minister Lapid. I think they're trying to kindly and respectfully engage President Biden and the team. But I don't think anybody that I've talked to or, or even read their comments, I'm not hearing anybody say, oh, good, that, that trip by the president <laughs> went so well, we now yeah. feel better. Yeah. I don't hear that. Yeah. So I just want our listeners not to be hearing this from a political or partisan perspective, right. from a, but from a prayer perspective. Yes. How can we be praying for the peace of Jerusalem just because the Abraham Accords have created peace between Israel and, and four Arab countries? And OK, not yet Saudis, but it does not mean there's peace in the region. The yeah. biggest cause of war would be Iran at this point. Uh, unless and until we get to the point of the war of Gog and Magog, and then it would be Russia and Iran. Yeah. And we are trending in that direction. And it's, it's very unnerving. 
It is unnerving. It's it's also uh, very um, uh, very interesting to keep uniting these conversations around biblical prophecy and geopolitics in the epicenter region. It's it's fascinating, Joel. It's such a privilege to be able to have these conversations with you. And for our listeners, I hope that they'll uh, really understand what they're hearing uh, in light of. Uh, what they get from the mainstream media all too often, and how this insight really can help us understand what's going on uh, in the epicenter right now. So, Joel, thank you, and uh, well, appreciate, appreciate your this. time. And I look forward to part two of this of this conversation. Yeah, we're going to do some good with that, I think. Um, and to our listeners, if you'd like to learn more about the Joshua Fund, visit our website at joshuafund.com, and there you can learn about what we're doing in the Middle East to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus and how you can participate in the healing work we're doing in this critical region. And as always, check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. Inside the Epicenter.